Good morning, and thank you all for being here on this uh, Tuesday morning. 808 nurses, three certified registered nurse anesthetists, 22 nurse practitioners, 193 respiratory therapists, and 20 paramedics. These are the number of healthcare personnel beginning to deploy this morning to 50 hospitals across the state to meet the staffing shortages in our hospitals. This medical staffing was secured through utilization and awarding of, the, of four of the original 19 bids that MEMA received on August the 13th. Put differently, we are deploying over 1,000 health care personnel within six business days of the RFQ closing and within nine business days of the Department of Health official ask. Of course, as you know, when in the middle of an emergency, there is no distinction between a business day and a Saturday or a Sunday. This, in my view, is an impressive feat, and I'd like to thank MEMA, and the Department of Health for helping make this happen so quickly. Onboarding this medical staff will be phased in over time. Level one and level two trauma hospital requests have already been fulfilled, and level three hospital requests are currently being processed and fulfilled. I mentioned earlier that we are deploying to 50 hospitals today. We anticipate that all staffing requests for the 61 hospitals that made them should be met no later than the end of this week. In addition to the personnel I just mentioned, a 23-person active duty team arrived in Jackson as part of the Department of Defense COVID-19 response operation. 20 of the 23 person team are active duty Air Force medical personnel, while three of those 23 are part of a command and control element. Today, we are anticipating another 23 person team of active duty Army military personnel. They are in processing in preparation to provide assistance in Tupelo. Like the first team, 20 of those 23 will be medical personnel and three will serve in a command and control element. U.S. Army North, under the U.S. Northern Command's oversight, will provide operational command of the active duty military COVID-19 response team. I've said this multiple times throughout this pandemic, but I'll say it again. My top priority throughout the pandemic has and will always be protecting the integrity of our healthcare system. We have been working around the clock to secure additional medical personnel through both federal and private sector sources to shore up the staffing shortages that our hospitals find themselves in. Getting boots on the ground this quickly is a step in the right direction. I'm grateful to each and all of the healthcare professionals who are working day and night to take care of our fellow Mississippians, and I'm grateful to those who are coming here to help. Having these staffing needs met will help to alleviate a portion of the strain on our healthcare system and ensure that all Mississippians that need care will receive the quality care they deserve. In addition, last week we administered over 81,000 vaccines. Of those, approximately 53,000 were first doses. We have now been distributing vaccines for 36 weeks in Mississippi. This number of 81,000 is the 11th highest total out of those 36 weeks and it is the sixth week in a row that we have had week over week increases. 
It is the largest number of vaccine doses that have been administered in Mississippi since the middle of April. As I have repeatedly done throughout this year, I encourage each and every one of you to consult with your doctor, study the facts, and decide what is best for you and your families. I will continue to defend your right to make your own choices about your health care. That being said, the facts continue to point to the vaccine as being safe and effective and the best way to preventing serious illness and death as a result of COVID-19. According to the latest data, and I know Dr. Byers probably has uh, uh, data that is updated um, one day after this, but according to the latest data as of Sunday, there were 1,563 people in the hospital fighting COVID, which is down from our most recent peak of 1,667. 465 patients were in the ICU. The most recent data also continues to show that a 98% of all new cases 89% of all hospitalizations and 87% of deaths are amongst those who were not fully vaccinated. While we have a long way to go, there is hope. We are now starting to obtain the medical personnel needed to alleviate some of the stress on our health care system, and we are continuing to see increases in vaccinations. I truly believe that if we all continue to do our part, if we all continue to work together, we will get through these challenges. Now, before I turn it over to Director McCraney and Dr. Byers, I would like to take a moment to discuss another item that has been in the news for months and will likely be in the news over the next couple of days. Tomorrow and Thursday, Members of the legislature will be holding hearings to discuss the future of our state's income tax. I want to personally thank Senator Harkins and Representative Lamar for working on this issue and for having these hearings. I'm also glad that the Lieutenant Governor, the Speaker, and I all agree that the income tax should be eliminated and that doing so best positions Mississippi for long-term success. I hope that once the hearings are over, the legislature will realize that eliminating Mississippi's income tax is needed and reducing the tax burden on Mississippians across the board is the best way to ensure our state's economic prosperity. I hope that once the hearings are over, the legislature will realize that the best way forward is to not swap the income tax for increases in sales taxes, agriculture taxes, and other taxes. If you agree with me on that, that we should eliminate the income tax without raising taxes in other areas, I recommend you mention that to your legislators. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I'm opposed to taking less from you here and taking more from you there. I'm opposed to robbing from Peter to pay Paul. I've been in contact with many small businesses across Mississippi including in the manufacturing and agricultural space, with outside think tanks and many other stakeholders. Based on my conversations with them, it's clear. The consensus is that eliminating, not swapping the tax burden is the way to go. Today, Mississippi stands in the best fiscal shape and the best financial shape we've ever been in. Thanks in large part to Mississippians' willingness to go back to work despite this global pandemic. Thanks to them, Mississippi ended the most recent fiscal year over a billion dollars above original revenue estimates. As Lieutenant Governor, I was proud to propose the largest tax cut in Mississippi history. We were able to get that done, eliminating the 3% income tax bracket without increasing anybody's taxes. We did it before, and it is my firm belief that we can do it again. Now is the time to get this done. 
We can no longer kick the can down the road when it comes to getting rid of the income tax. Every single day, we are competing with Texas and Tennessee and Florida for investment capital. Every single day, we are competing with Texas, Tennessee, and Florida for human capital. If this doesn't happen now, if we swap taxes instead of eliminating them, we will never be able to do away with them once and for all. With that, I want to thank Director McCraney and Dr. Byers for being here. I'll turn it over to Director McCraney first so he can talk about some of the specifics. Director McCraney. Just want to expound on what the uh, the governor kind of uh, talked about earlier and give some specifics and uh, also to let you know that uh, by friday of this week uh, we will do a, a release on all contracts all hospitals that have given orders so we're still putting that together uh but but right now uh it's it's uh a thousand and forty six i mean any 11 uh business days that we've been able to do uh and get out to the hospital so what so what does that really mean that means about 994 hospital beds. Specifically, that's 757 med surge and 237 on the ICU side. So that's significant. That's gonna relieve the pressure in 50 uh, hospitals who've made requests, and as we work the next 11, we'll, we'll add those numbers in as well. So I think that's uh, very important. I, I think there's, a, there's another note that needs to be made. There was a, needs to be made. There was a lot of uh, conversation early on about a state of emergency. When do, you, when do you stop having a state of emergency? I can guarantee you if I did not have a state of emergency in effect right now, we would not have done this in 11 days. It is impossible under state law to do that, but through the guidance of the governor and his staff and the abilities for us to operate under a state of emergency, we were able to issue those RFQs, the request for quotes, get those processed and get these folks in route to Mississippi, which I think is significant. Uh, and, and that needs to be maintained. On, on the back side, I do want to talk about, and I can answer questions later, uh, Tishomingo County had a storm over the weekend. I do need to, to, to kind of give them a shout out. We've got uh, no destroyed homes at this time. We've got eight major, 17 minor, and 33 affected homes up in that area. We had a, a, a tornado that, that came up very quickly uh, on Saturday and over the weekend, as you saw some of the flooding in, in Tennessee. And uh, we've had uh, some of our staff there, as well as the local emergency responders. We've been responding to that since Saturday. And I'm, I'm glad to report that uh, we have eight days of hope. We also have uh, VOAD, uh, the volunteer organizations after disaster have been deployed, as well as the Southern Baptist. And we've been in there with uh, TARP missions. And we're also going in with our individual assistance officers to, to work with that uh, county as well. Governor, that's all I have for right now. As has often been the case throughout the pandemic, Dr. Uh, Byers steps in very capably for um, Dr. Dobbs in, in his absence. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Byers. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Governor. And I want to thank the Governor and I want to thank uh, Mima and the Director for their efforts in, in um, helping our hospital capacity throughout the state. I think this is going to make a huge difference for us moving forward. If we look today at our numbers, we're reporting out uh, 3,291 additional cases and unfortunately 111 additional deaths. Now, this is the highest total of deaths we've had uh, to date so far during the pandemic. The previous high was back in uh, January when we were having our large peak over the, over the winter months. Um, when we look at those deaths, guys, um, we're looking at about 87% of them are not vaccinated, not fully vaccinated. Um, when we look at the breakdown of the deaths, um, more than 50% of them are over the age of, of 65. And a good number of those individuals, 75 and older, 75% uh, or, or more are, are not fully vaccinated. So we are still seeing an impact in our older individuals um, and we do know that the vaccine is very protective for these folks at preventing the severe complications and illness that can occur. Now, when we look at our hospitalizations over time, we have begun to see some flattening off in our hospitalizations, in our IC use, in our ventilator use. Today, we're reporting out 
1,655 individuals who are hospitalized. So that's a little bit higher than yesterday. But if you look at the trends over time, it looks like we are leveling off in the number of hospitalizations. This is the good news, and I really want to talk about some of the good things that we're seeing right now. Um, number one, when you look at our cases over time, it looks like we are beginning to plateau. A couple of days does not a trend make, but um, it does look like we're moving in the right direction with our case numbers. It does look like we're starting to have some leveling off with our hospitalizations. Certainly, we will, we've seen that with ventilator use and ICU, ICU um, uh, admissions as well. But we have had some increased deaths. And we do know from our experience that when we have big surges in cases, the, the deaths often follow several days later, once an individual becomes ill enough to become severely ill. And so we may anticipate um, some significant increases in our deaths still. We're going to watch that. Um, and some other good things that we see are the um, impacts of monoclonal antibodies. And we do feel like that this is a life-saving measure. We feel like this is what is additionally helping our hospital capacity. We know that individuals who are infected, if they get monoclonal antibodies early in the course of their illness, that it can prevent hospitalizations, it can prevent deaths. And we've seen an increase in the utilization of monoclonal antibodies throughout the state. We've seen the increases in the um, vaccinations that the governor mentioned, and we anticipate that we'll continue to see those. Now, at the health department, we do have the availability for the third dose for people who are immunocompromised now. They can make that appointment on our vaccine scheduler on the website, and th basically they're able to self-attest that they have an immunocompromising condition, and they are able to make an appointment for that third dose at a county health department now. This is good news. And additionally, and, and you all saw this, that the FDA did give approval for the Pfizer vaccine, uh, full approval for individuals 16 and older. This is a great step in the right direction. We feel like that for many of those people who may have still been hesitant, may have still been on the fence, that we will see some increases in vaccinations as a result of that. Um, and I believe that that's the, the report for today. Governor, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Byers, Director McCraney. Um, as has been the case uh, throughout uh, the last uh, year and a half, I want to personally thank both of you for, for your service. Um, and, and to all of your teams, um, it's easy to uh, sit on the back row and, and complain, and um, it's a little bit more difficult to be uh, in the middle of the game actually playing. And um, you and your teams have been players, active participants in uh, responding to ensuring every step of the way that uh, everyone that could get better with quality care received that quality care. Uh, our goal from the beginning, uh, which continues to be our goal today. So with that, I'm going to open the floor to questions. I'll start, uh, Courtney Ann. Governor, have you made any personal visits to any of the hospitals in the state? I know a lot of the conversation today was about hospitals. Have you gone to any of the hospitals in the last couple of weeks as this surge was happening? We've heard anecdotally from many of these doctors and hospital administrators about just the nightmare that it is. Have you gone to see that firsthand? If so, how has that impacted your I have your not been in any hospitals. Um, do you have any to plans to I don't currently do so? have plans to do so. Um, I'm certainly uh, not opposed to doing so. I know we have uh, great um, health care workers that are working every single day. Um, and quite frankly, uh, I, I really uh, appreciate um, everyone that is, that is doing uh, those jobs on a day-to-day on -day basis. And I, I make myself available to you in the press. Uh, regularly and honestly I think that those nurses and those doctors are better served treating patients than they are showing politicians around um, their facility um, but again uh, it's um, something that I think uh, is important is, is to restate um, we've been working day and night to get reinforcements here because we know uh, that that we have significant additional capacity in our hospitals uh, through hospital beds, but we don't have significant 
ability to add patients because of the lack of staffing in our hospitals, and that's what we've been focused on. Scott. What other restrictions or steps are you considering if this pandemic number continues to go up, get worse, or whatnot? Uh, I don't anticipate um, any uh, lockdowns. I don't anticipate any statewide mask mandates. Um, I, I think uh, if you look at uh, what's happened in other countries as well as what's happened in other states across America, uh, we've spent a good bit. Of, I've personally spent a good bit of time uh, looking at the uh, Delta variant, and it's very, very quick and rapid rise in cases in the country of Israel. I've looked at the uh, Delta variant, and it's very, very quick and rapid rise uh, in the country of, of Great Britain. Um, and what you find is, um, in both of those instances, uh, and then you also look at what's happened, uh, at least initially in the states of Missouri, in Arkansas, in the state of Louisiana. Uh, again, a very quick and rapid rise in the total number of cases. Um, what you then see is when, when the numbers start plateauing, they tend to decline relatively quickly as well. Um, now, we're not there yet. That's certainly what's happened in Israel, certainly what happened in England. It's what's happened, uh, it's what's beginning to happen, it appears, although uh, we're about three or four, five, six, seven days behind uh, Missouri and Arkansas and Louisiana. Uh, it's beginning to uh, happen there as you start seeing their total number of cases roll over. Um, but we also know, and, and I want the people of Mississippi to, uh, to be aware of this, we also know um, that deaths are a lagging indicator. Uh, we had our most deaths uh, ever reported, I believe, uh, yesterday, 100 and 111 deaths reported on this morning's report. Um, now, to be fair, that 111 number was uh, over a multi-week period. Um, they, were not, they did not all happen yesterday. It's over a multi-week period, but deaths are a lagging indicator. Um, you know, you, you start with a large number of cases uh, going up, and then over time, hospitalizations lag cases, and then, of course, deaths ultimately lag um, those, um, those uh, in um, the hospital and those in ICU beds. So uh, we need to be um, cognizant of that, and we need to be aware of that, and, and we need to know uh, that um, where we were uh, a month, a month and a half ago, uh, with very few daily deaths, we're going to see an uptick um, over the next couple of weeks and, and maybe longer. Um, but eventually, if, if in fact we, as Dr. Byers mentioned, we are plateauing uh, and, in, and eventually rolling over uh, the total number of cases, eventually the hospitalizations and the fatalities will follow that as well. Yes, sir. Uh, this is for Dr. Byers. Uh, back on the topic of boosters, uh, what are the options for immunocompromised folks who got the Johnson & Johnson vaccine? That's such a great question. Thank you. And the, and the question is about um, boosters for, for Johnson & Johnson um, recipients. And so the FDA is, is currently looking at that data now. Remember, we didn't start rolling out the Johnson & Johnson until March. Um, and so it's a little bit behind when we started the, the mRNA vaccines of Pfizer and Moderna. So they're looking at that data right now. Certainly the FDA and CDC, and we agree, feel like that the Johnson & Johnson is giving individuals good protection from those severe complications. But it may well be that a booster is recommended for those individuals at some point in time in the future. I think the data is a little bit behind because they started vaccinating a little bit later with Johnson & Johnson. And so we do anticipate some additional information on that. Right now, though, we feel like those individuals who have received Johnson & Johnson vaccine are protected. But that's a great question. Thank you. Yes, sir. Governor, uh, can you uh, explain why you choose to um, take reactionary measures to protecting the state hospitals versus taking reactionary measures like we saw last year with the mandates? Um, what I would tell you is uh, we are in the, the process of um, dealing with the uh, emergency as we see it. Um, it has been uh, told to us by 61 hospitals around the state. Um, which, by the way, uh, according to your original question, I speak to um, individuals in the hospital pretty regularly. Um, some administrators, a lot of doctors, and a lot of nurses uh, that I've had the opportunity to communicate with over the last 
um, year and a half, uh, truly many healthcare heroes. Uh, we're going to continue to uh, meet the needs. Uh, the, the fact is that um, that the um, biggest uh, challenge that is before us, as I've said over the last several weeks, uh, is the lack of staffing within our hospitals, and we're willing to do whatever it takes to meet uh, those staffing needs. Let's go, Bailey. You want to ask someone? Hunter Dawkins from the Gazebo Gazette has a question. Great. Governor, thank you, Governor, and uh, thank you, Bailey. Uh, two questions. The first question would be, is there an estimate of an amount of people that are unvaccinated that would get, that would, that would get to the number of COVIDs uh, that you would, would think about issuing a vaccine mandate? And then also, too, um, you know, is there any possibility of the health department? I know there has been some news out about possibility of them trying to uh, do uh, take action against people that have not received vaccines. And the second thing on the income uh, question I have about the cutting the income tax, um, as you as Lieutenant Governor, I know you've pushed this for a long time, but also being a numbers guy, what areas have, you know, you, just cutting the income, there has to be some raises of taxes for somebody. Uh, and if you wouldn't mind speaking to that, Governor, I appreciate it. Yeah, so to your first question, there is, uh, I have no intention of issuing a vaccine mandate, uh, period. Um, to your second question, uh, I, I do not agree. Uh, I appreciate and respect your opinion, but I do not agree that you've got to raise taxes on somebody to cut taxes on somebody else. Um, not only do I not agree, uh, we've proven it time and again uh, over the last 10 years. Uh, many of the, the same people who are screaming and hollering about the elimination of the income tax and the need to raise taxes on other people were screaming exactly the same thing five or six years ago when we passed the largest tax cut in Mississippi history. Um, again, we uh, passed what was then nearly a half a billion dollar tax cut. Uh, we phased it in over time. And what's happened is total revenues have continued to rise. What has happened is we find ourselves in a year in which the most recent fiscal year concluded and we had literally collected over a billion dollars more in revenue than was originally projected. And so um, if, in fact, you were to look at the $1.8 billion uh, that we collect in, in individual income taxes today, uh, we collected over a billion dollars total in, in um, the re most recent fiscal year that um, was over and above estimates than that was over and above what was spent. And honestly, if you consider the 2% set aside, um, it was really closer to one point, over $1.1 $1 billion. So we could, we could very quickly uh, eliminate a big portion of the income tax just through that revenue growth that has transpired. Um, and then we could uh, eliminate over time, uh, and we could even put in triggers if that's what the legislature felt they needed to do, um, so that as revenues continue to grow, uh, that we would see uh, continued reductions in the income tax. It doesn't have to be done overnight. Bailey? Nick Juden from Mississippi Free Press has a question. Great. Hey, thank you. Um, so I'd love to hear from all three of you on this, if possible. Obviously, we're seeing a huge new influx of healthcare workers. In previous weeks, we heard real fears from hospital leadership that this wave could put hospitals across the state on full diversion. Are we confident that these new workers have put that fear behind us? How easily can we expand this workforce if needed? And how long can we expect them to shore up the state's response? The, the, so, Nick, to, to answer your question, um, the, the, these contracts that have been put in place uh, are for a time period not to exceed 60 days. The, we clearly have the ability to renegotiate, um, but uh, I am confident because we have fulfilled, uh, if not all, the vast majority of requests from the hospital executives themselves 
um, all of their staffing requests, uh, that this is uh, going to um, eliminate uh, any, um, any challenges uh, that may come before us. Uh, clearly, if, the, uh, if we are not plateaued and if numbers continue to um, significantly, uh, if they were to significantly increase, uh, then we would deal with that at, at, at that time. Um, and the only uh, final caveat that I will mention, uh, Nick, is, um, and, and I know a lot of people don't want to hear this, but it's true, um, in this particular surge of the uh, coronavirus, uh, the states in Missouri, Arkansas, Louisiana, and of course us in Mississippi are, are on the front end of, of this Delta variant wave, in my opinion. What you're seeing now is more and more states are seeing higher and higher cases. And, and so um, what I think you're going to see is um, as we progress forward, uh, there are going to be more and more uh, states that are in need of these additional health care workers. Uh, obviously, the increase in demand for them is going to cause uh, the price to go up, and it's going to make it even more difficult uh, to ascertain the help uh, of these entities. And so uh, it's why it was so important that we act swiftly to meet the needs that are before us, uh, and we'll continue to do so. Uh, I'll, Dr. Byers, you want to go next? And Thank, thank you, Governor. No, and I would say, you know, um, I think we're in a pretty good spot right now. Um, I think what's going to be important, and, and I think Mississippians are showing us that they're willing to do this, but I think the things that we, we need to do to continue to protect the hospitals and protect those folks that are working so hard in the hospitals is to continue to increase our vaccinations, and we've seen more and more Mississippians who are willing to do that. Um, and if you do get sick, if you, if you do uh, get infected with COVID, talk to your provider about um, getting monoclonal antibodies. This is, this is life-saving. And, you know, on our hotline now, and you can call the Department of Health hotline, and we can um, give information about resources, of, uh, about what monoclonal antibodies are, but in addition, where um, individuals can find those monoclonal antibody providers near them and help facilitate getting them into it. So I think that as long as we continue to do these things, um, we're, we're going to see the, the needle move. Um, you know, I think we're going to start seeing some benefits soon of those increased vaccinations that we've, uh, that we've seen over the last several weeks. I'll just add, you know, back into the staffing uh, that the governor uh, alluded to. First contract is for 60 days. I've got options uh, to continue those on after as long as we need it. Uh, we, we looked at the eight and a half week uh, time frame, and that's what we originally wanted to go with. Uh, talking to Dr. Byers, Dr. Uh, uh, and, and others, that, that that is what we needed to originally go with. But we can e extend that for however long we need it. And that, that goes to back football season. You've got accidents there. You've got people going to the hospital for other things besides COVID. So we're, we're in competition uh, in those ICU beds as well as uh, the med surge beds for regular admissions as well as COVID. And I'll just um, conclude that conversation uh, by saying there is no state law which precludes uh, individual hospitals from hiring staff. Um, we've made the decision to do this because we want to protect uh, individual Mississippians. Emily. I wanted to ask about the planning process for the possibility of nurses and other healthcare professionals being offered more money to go to work for private contractors and leaving their current employer and maybe going outside Mississippi to work to make more money. Um, it's a reality that's been happening across the country. What are the contingency plans in Mississippi to deal with that situation? Yeah, there's, there's no question that uh, we have um, seen a reduction of some 2,000 um, total uh, nurses uh, in our hospitals. They've gone into uh, private doc offices. They've gone uh, to work for staffing companies. They've decided to travel and get paid more and in some instances they've simply retired um, and so the, the first uh, thing I will tell you 
with respect to nurse retention is um, it is it is the um, responsibility of the health care provider uh, to ensure that they have adequate staffing uh, to meet uh, whatever their demand is that's that's first and foremost uh, their um, their responsibility uh, we, we have stepped in here um, because that was a responsibility that that had to be fulfilled and in an emergency situation we had the ability and the authority to do so uh, and I'm glad that that we did uh, in terms of uh, overall planning I, I'll let um, I guess dr. Byers um, if you uh, if you want to talk about that I don't think it's Mima's uh, responsibility to keep um, uh, individual nurses uh, here I think it's a it's a it's a health care no, no more than it is uh, for Mima's responsibility to keep uh, other individual employees at private employers um, here uh, clearly uh, wages um, if in fact there is a, an issue with uh, wages then then the, they're gonna have to meet that so um, dr. Byers I don't know if you have any comments no uh, thank you governor and you know this is a it is a challenge um, it, it's it's nurses and it's other health care staff that we've lost in the in the last um, several months, and I think that you know um, there's some things that we can do. I think you know one of the things that we've done is is working with MEMA to to try to get additional staff, retaining staff, and and having competitive salaries and bonuses for staff is is something that we're just going to have to continue to look at and work through. Yes, sir. Um, with the FDA approving uh, the, the Pfizer shot, getting it full approval, does that, do you, do you think, you always said that you, you encourage people to talk to the doctors and make the right decision. Do you think the quote unquote right decision has been made easier for people now that there's a shot with full approval? Uh, I do think that uh, the, the full approval removes uh, a potential roadblock that some people had. Um, it wasn't a roadblock for me. Uh, I got the shot in January, uh, but it, it certainly has been used as um, by some uh, to say that, that they would uh, really lots of people across the country have said, you know, I may get the shot, but I want to um, I want to see full approval by FDA before I, I do so. Um, and and so um, for, for those individuals, then, then clearly uh, that was a step in, in, in the right direction um, for me. Um, the, the other th point that I'll just make is, uh, you know, initially there was some conversation about uh, the size and the scope of the clinical trials, um, which was a, a valid concern and a valid question. And what, what I said then is at the time the, the Pfizer vaccine had a, a clinical trial scope of about 40,000 individuals. Um, there are many medicines in America that have been approved that had far fewer than 40,000. But even so, at this point in Mississippi alone, we've had 2.46 million shots given. Uh, you know, we're, we're in the midst of the largest clinical trial. Um, uh, you know, to the extent that um, that it is a clinical trial, we're in the midst of the largest clinical trial in in, in a long, long, long time, and in our state, in America, and, and across the the globe. And so, I don't know that that individuals. Um, I don't know how many individuals there are out there that, that, that will now go get the shot because the uh, FDA has approved Pfizer. But again, it has got to be a roadblock uh, that has been eliminated for some. And I think across America, that number is fairly large. Yes, ma'am. With, with the lack of staffing, Governor, um, are you considering today of possibly calling a special session to help address Mississippi's hospital staffing shortage? Uh, at this time, I don't have any plans to call a special session. Bailey. Annie Summerhays from Y'all Politics has a question. I have a two-part question. The first part is for Governor Reeves. When the Mississippi Department of Health issued the isolation order last Friday, was there any coordination with your office prior to that recommendation? No. The second question is for, oh. The second question is for Dr. Byers. The order says those who are positive for COVID must isolate for 10 days at home. Are there any exceptions to that when seeking treatment for those who might be confused, or are there any additional exceptions to that order as well? Certainly, we want individuals to, to seek treatment if they need to, and, and 
but but the intent of the order, and I have to tell y'all guys, let's 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 set the stage. This is not a new order. This is an order that we released back in 2020. This was a reissue of the same order that's been out there to remind individuals of the um, seriousness of COVID and that if you are infected, the best way to limit transmission is to isolate yourself, is to keep yourself away from, from other individuals. And certainly there can be exceptions for seeking treatment and, and you know, that's, that's part of the process. But again, the intent of this is to remind people that if you are infected, the expectation is, is that you will isolate. Dr. Byers is correct. This is, uh, this is not new. Uh, it is, um, and it also, by the way, in, in my view, is um, the way in which the vast majority of individuals who test positive for COVID are acting. Uh, when you test positive for COVID, uh, you self-isolate. That's what you do. Um, if you uh, have um, close exposure and are unvaccinated, uh, you should also uh, quarantine and self-isolate, um, in, in my opinion. And so, again, it's, um, it, it is um, a reminder to individuals that if you're positive for COVID, then you are most likely uh, contagious. And if you're most likely contagious, the best way for you not to spread it is to not come in contact with somebody. Scott. Governor, how much is this contract employee going to, uh, labor going to cost us? And specifically, where's the money coming from? I'm going to let um, Mac uh, give you an exact number, but uh, I think if you said uh, $80 million, you'd get really, really close. Um, and the money is, uh, this is a Stafford Act eligible expense. And under the existing uh, federal decree, 100% um, of that will be uh, provided um, and paid for by um, FEMA through the Stafford Act. We have asked for, uh, because the numbers are fairly large, uh, we have asked for expedited reimbursement by the feds. Um, I don't know if they, I haven't talked to Mac in the last few hours. I don't know if they've agreed to that yet or not, but, um, but we've certainly asked for it. If they do not agree to that, uh, then we will, we will cash flow it internally. Uh, we have the uh, state law and the mechanisms by which to do it. You want to give a specific number? Perfect. Uh, the governor's been reading my notes. Uh, that, that was a, a, actually very perfect. About $10 million a week is, is, is what this is going to cost, the initial push. And we have asked for an expedited. Uh, we're, we're compiling all of those numbers together out of the 61. And uh, we're going to do it just like every other emergency that we run. Uh, we, we try to front load as much as we can. Uh, when the governor was uh, lieutenant governor, the disaster trust fund never went low. Uh, and, and we've still got that in effect. Uh, as well as even for our other disasters. So it's not just COVID we're running. I have 18 federally declared disasters in the state of Mississippi that are open right now. Uh, I averaged about $365 million worth of payouts to the locals last year. So we continue at day 534 of COVID to still operate under the others as well. So we've got it. Uh, we're able to do it and everything's spot on, sir. Thank you. Jeff. Two uh, tax questions. Uh, it, you've said numerous times as far as a tax swap, you're you're opposed to that. It, is that something you could definitively say would face a, a veto, perhaps at this point? Uh, what, what I can tell you is I believe that we can eliminate the income tax over time without raising taxes on anybody else. Then the other part of that, there's also been some talk of cutting, I guess, in half. The grocery tax, uh, where do you stand on that with the grocery tax? Look, uh, my entire career, I've been uh, strongly supportive of uh, reducing taxes on hardworking Mississippians. Um, I think we should eliminate the income tax. Um, if they send me a, um, a bill that just eliminates a bunch of other taxes I'll, or reduces a bunch of other taxes, I'd probably sign that too. Yes, sir. Yes, Governor. Um, the school report came out from Department of Health, and uh, last week, 5,500 students and nearly 1,000 teachers tested positive for COVID-19. I was curious what your thoughts are on seeing this continued transmission in schools. Well, I, I don't think that you can uh, necessarily um, 
make the leap from those individuals testing positive to the transmission occurring in schools. Um, some of it most likely occurred in schools. Some of it most likely occurred in the community. Um, and so I think it's important that we uh, make sure that we uh, don't jump to um, irresponsible conclusions without having the data to verify that. Um, but uh, there's, there is uh, no doubt that we have uh, kids and teachers throughout the state that have tested positive. Uh, we have kids and teachers throughout the state that have uh, been required to quarantine, and that uh, wreaks havoc on uh, many uh, individual schools, individual classrooms, and individual districts throughout the state. Um, but I still believe very strongly uh, that having our kids in the classroom uh, is vitally important, and in the long term, um, the, the risk associated uh, with not being in the classroom is greater uh, than the risk associated with being in the classroom. Bailey? Tom Dees from Fox 13 in Memphis has a question. Okay. Governor, if you would, what do you, what do you attribute the increase in vaccinations to? And we're one of the least vaccinated states in the country. What do you do to change that? That's question one. Question two, can you speak to the help coming to Baptist DeSoto and Methodist Olive Branch here in DeSoto County? And can you speak to the possibility of a field hospital? Yeah, so the, the first question with respect to vaccinations, um, I think that as more and more of our fellow Mississippians get more and more information, they are more and more likely to make the decision based upon the facts. Um, and, and I think uh, the facts are becoming more and more clear uh, that, the, that we find ourselves in large part, certainly with respect to hospitalizations and deaths um, and new cases, uh, that we are in, in the midst of a phase of the pandemic of the unvaccinated. And I think that's one of the reasons that more and more people are getting vaccinated. There are a lot of other reasons, by the way. Um, school just recently started back. And so I think there are a lot of kids that, um, whose parents uh, were going to get their kids vaccinated, but they chose um, to procrastinate to a certain extent because uh, back in May and June and July, the numbers were, or early July, the numbers were so very low. Uh, that, that there wasn't a sense of urgency. And as the numbers started to rise, that sense of urgency became uh, more and more urgent. And so I think you're seeing uh, a, a good many of our numbers uh, today are, are that, because I, I hear about it um, uh, pretty regularly. And so I think that's part of the issue. Um, and then I think, you know, the other uh, hurdles that are being um, removed, like the FDA approval yesterday, there's just uh, a, a myriad of different uh, proposals. I can't personally speak to um, the requests that were made by the two hospitals in DeSoto County because I don't know exactly what they were, uh, but I do know this. Uh, we have 61 uh, hospitals that by the end of the week will receive uh, the help that they have requested, and if those two hospitals in DeSoto County uh, made those requests, uh, then my uh, gut is to tell you that they will have met, those needs will have been met no later than uh, two to three days from today. Mac, I don't Field guess, uh, I, uh, yeah, I don't, okay. On, on, the, on the back side of that request, you, you alluded to field hospitals and uh, almost 90% of the hospitals in the state are authorized under the Stafford Act to request reimbursement for if they want to open up a field hospital. but. What we've done is empty beds are in hospitals. So we've gotten and, and, and authorized and gotten staff to go into, and you're going into an environment that already has oxygen flow that's needed, already has all the services in there, whether it's, it's food, pharmacies, everything else. Why create another hospital outside of a hospital when that hospital is not being totally utilized? That has been the format that we've done up to this point. But uh, those, those uh, hospitals that want to entertain a field hospital, please call MEMA and uh, we'll get you enrolled into the system and we'll make sure that you can uh, uh, fill out your paperwork right and we'll, we're the ones that will help you do the project worksheet uh, to get you across that line if that's the way that they choose to go. Bobby. Governor, back to tax for just, just a second if you will. Uh, there's studies that show in Mississippi 
uh, a large, the poor people, because we're so dependent on the sales tax, pay a lot greater percentage of their income in taxes, in state taxes, than the wealthy people. Seems like you would just be es escalating that by just reducing the income tax. I mean, is that is that your intent to? Well, actually, it's exactly the opposite, Bobby. Um, it's exactly the opposite. If everybody pays the same sales tax and nobody pays income tax, then what actually happens is uh, the people who are currently paying a higher percentage of their income pay the same percentage of their income as do those who are currently paying a lower percentage of their income. So in other words, um, if, um, if you, if you um, look at those individuals that have a lower amount of taxable income, if they're paying 5% of it in income taxes, 7% of it in sales taxes, then that 7% in sales tax is a higher overall percentage of their net income than what the, the individual who is earning much more and therefore not consuming 100% of their income. So the, the analysis is exactly the opposite of what you just laid out. I'll be happy to. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely do that. Um, well, because it is, uh, it is the the income, the the um, the use of um, of taxes based upon expenditures. Um, I, I think will certainly uh, drive that. So, yes, ma'am. Um, so we have some viewer questions. This is perhaps for Dr. Byers. So, Dr. Barnes, when students and teachers must test due to COVID exposure, I guess people are asking, why is there no specific site for them to go to? Um, and then why are teachers held accountable with their own personal days, no pay, when they're out due to COVID? So, I, I can't answer the question about, about the accountability for, for teachers, obviously, with their, with their um, leave status. But I can tell you that we do have testing available um, for, for students and teachers who are exposed. Certainly one of the things that we've done is we've worked very hard to make sure that that testing is available on site to the schools. And we have that through a couple of programs. Uh, one where we've provided testing supplies directly to the schools for them to be able to utilize that test. Um, but we also have a vendor that works with, with the, um, the schools throughout the state to provide tests. And we have in many counties throughout the state, we have our, our drive-through, or not drive-through, but it, testing in our county health departments, and we're continuing to expand that testing. And so I would encourage folks to look at our website, look at where those testing sites available are, and we do have that free testing available. Dr. Byers, just to follow up, if one kid in the house tests positive for COVID, do all of the siblings also need to quarantine from school? Uh, they would if the siblings are unvaccinated. Yeah, if 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 students are exposed to to a COVID infected individual, whether that exposure occurs at school or whether it occurs at home, those individuals are still exposed to COVID, and we recommend that they quarantine for that full period, even if it's if it's of a sibling. And to your first question, um, actually, the extension of the emergency order allowed for local governmental entities to allow employees that are on required isolation or quarantine orders uh, to not have to take personal leave. Now, the, the governmental entity, the local governmental entity is not required to do that, but one of the, one of the reasons, a very small part, but one of the many reasons we extended the emergency order uh, was to give local governmental agencies the ability to do that. Now, if you're a teacher or an employee, the best way uh, for you not to have to uh, be put in a position where you're trying to con be convinced uh, whether you're going to take personal leave or, or not um, is to not get COVID and to be, vaccin to be vaccinated certainly uh, reduces your risk, doesn't eliminate it. Um, it reduces your risk considerably of of that so i'm gonna ask one more question and we're going to go um, uh, just a quick two-part question on on vaccines the first one i know that it was asked about vaccine mandates but what does that mean for state employees could an individual um, agency director ask that they're not one that reports to me 
And then secondly, the White House vaccination coordinator, we understand, is in town today meeting with public health officials in the area. Just wanted to get your commentary on that. This would be the second time that someone from the White House has come to Mississippi in regards to vaccines. Yeah, so uh, I think there's a, a concerted effort by people of all political stripes to uh, encourage individuals to uh, get the um, vaccine. Um, and, and I think that's, that's healthy. Um, if you look at our state, and, 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 and again, I know that there's, a, uh, there's been an attempt, uh, not necessarily by people in this room, but certainly by the national media, the, uh, to uh, try to convince folks that the, um, those who are vaccine hesitant uh, in America are uh, primarily um, rural Trump voters. Um, it's just not true. I understand that that's what's been uh, sold by some of the national media. That's just simply not true, at least not in Mississippi. If you look at the total number of individuals that have gotten vaccinated in our state, uh, we have a total um, African-American population that is about 37 to 38 percent of our total population. Uh, our total number of vaccines, uh, about 37 to 38 uh, percent, have gone to African-Americans. And so the way in which uh, math works is vaccine hesitancy in our state is, is, uh, and we spent a lot of time and effort uh, convincing uh, all communities um, to to figure out and look at the facts. But the vaccine hesitancy in Mississippi is about uh, just like the total number of shots is proportional to the uh, population. The vaccine hesitancy in Mississippi is about proportional uh, to um, to the. Uh, demographics in our state. And so, uh, again, I, I, I encourage uh, anyone uh, that will uh, encourage their, um, their friends and their neighbors uh, to get the vaccine uh, to do so. But I'll also tell you, and y'all been, a lot of y'all been around a long time um, and have heard me during political campaigns. I, I'm someone who believes very strongly uh, that political popularity is really not transferable. And so when politicians endorse a particular candidate in an election, it really usually doesn't have a whole lot of impact. Um, and I'm not sure that politicians endorsing one, one decision or another has a lot of impact. What does have an impact, however, is when you talk to your friends and your neighbors and you talk to people who respect you and you advise them um, as to why you made the decision that you made, you know, it doesn't do a lot of good to have people having a bunch of press conferences preaching uh, explaining to people why they're so dumb for having not made that decision yet. It does very little good. In fact, it, I would argue it probably does more harm than good. But if you sit down with your peer group, the people you go to church with, the people you go to Sunday school with, and you simply say, look, I've done this research. What research have you done? And talk to them. I made a decision to get um, the shot because um, of these three reasons. That goes a lot further than some politician standing up or, or some someone else standing up and and preaching uh, and telling you what you ought to do. So, again, it's a uh, I'm I, and I and I think our numbers really show that uh, as we've uh, seen over the last six weeks, every single week increases in the total number of individuals that have gotten vaccinated. Uh, we've got uh, just shy of 1.4 million Mississippians uh, that have taken the first shot. Um, that's really over half of, of those who are truly eligible. We've got 2.976 million people uh, in our state. Um, a big portion of those, uh, some probably 10% um, or so, uh, clearly are under the age of 12 and therefore are not eligible uh, for the vaccine. And so we're seeing upticks in the uptake in the, uh, in the vaccine. And, and because of that, I think the combination of a lot of different things um, is leading to um, our numbers um, stabilizing, uh, to our numbers plateauing, or at least it appears over a few days. Uh, we'll see where we go from here, because as Dr. Byers so appropriately said earlier, uh, four or five days does not a trend make, but um, it is certainly, when you look at the total number of hospitalizations from August the 9th to August the 27th, uh, over about a 10-day period, we actually saw about a 7 or 8% increase over the 10 days. And so uh, we're actually seeing a less than a 1% increase on average over those 10 days. Hopefully that continues. Uh, thank you all for being here. As always, I want to thank uh, MPB for their, their work and their efforts in uh, setting this up such that we can uh, speak directly to the people and also give uh, members of the press from other parts of the state 
an opportunity to ask questions. We appreciate all of you and uh, talk to you soon.